Killing Floor 2 is a co-op first-person horde shooter where you and up to five other friends are pitted against waves of horrific science experiments. Monsters with sharp teeth and terrifying powers. I could go on about this, but really, my somewhat dated but still serviceable review of Killing Floor 2, linked above and below, should suffice. As the game progresses and you, as hired mercenaries, kill off more and more mooks, you're rewarded with in-map dosh. This is a currency kept within the confines of a particular match that you're playing, used at the trader to buy weapons weapons, ammo, armor, and the like. The overarching point here is DOSH is granted fairly and equally to all players for the work they put in, and is only used to attain power within the confines of a level. This differs greatly from the DOSH Vault, which stores up an unrelated currency to DOSH called VOSH, which builds up as you complete daily and weekly tasks, eventually dropping loot boxes which can be opened for in-game untradeable cosmetics. Things like weapon skins, hats, everything you'd expect from your modern cosmetic loot box. Of course, these loot boxes boxes differ greatly from those dropped during games, which instead of loot boxes are loot boxes, except these ones require the purchase of keys with IRL money to open, and can drop items of real-world monetary value provided you can find the right buyer or go through the Steam Marketplace. The Marketplace, by the way, allows you to use real-world money to purchase weapon skins, keys, and other such commodities. This of course differs from the in-game store, which allows you to use real-world money to purchase weapon skins, keys, and other such commodities. And with the recent Grim Treatments update using the in-game store, not the out-of-game store, or the in-game in-game store or the in-game vault, you can now purchase weapons for real-world money, which allows you to purchase weapons with in-game money. To recap, the Marketplace is Steam's built-in API for buying and selling of cosmetics between players, the store is Killing Floor 2's in-game catalog of cosmetics and actual weapons for use in-match, the vault builds up Vosh, not Dosh, Vosh collected in-match for unlocking cosmetics, and the trader is the in-match store which uses Dosh, not Vosh, Dosh to buy weapons for that very match, which use the cosmetics unlocked from all the prior distributors and will offer the paid weapons purchased from the store provided you coughed up the cash. All of this is to say, when I'm telling you that Killing Floor 2's economy is a mess, I mean every facet of it. To oversimplify my points, I'm going to be setting aside the Steam Marketplace and the Dosh Vault as they have very little bearing on my gripes with Killing Floor 2's monetization scheme. Instead, I want to talk about the new addition of purchasable weapons using real-world cash to then be purchased using in-game Dosh. As of the recent and aforementioned Grim Treatments update, two weapons not accessible to players without spending real-world money have been added. The Rhino is a revolver that fires frag rounds that could be dual-wielded for effective target removal, and the Ion Thruster is, in all ways including physical, a lightsaber. This laser sword ignites foes that it strikes and builds up a charge while it's at it. At 100% charge, its wielder can unleash a devastating flame slash, dealing hundreds of damage in a line in front of them. Let me start by saying both of these weapons are, in my experience, good. They are by no means worth overlooking. I'm not here to talk about the meta of Killing Floor 2 so much as I am talking about its surrounding monetization, so I won't sit here and debate whether or not these items are top tier, but the point still stands that two powerful weapons sit behind a paywall for players who are interested in partaking. Developers of KF2, Tripwire, have been quoted as saying they've made a concerted effort to design these weapons to not be any better than any weapon of similarly targeted tier in terms of raw stats. In other words, these weapons are supposed to be different, but not better. To an extent, I understand this mentality, and I can see how they tried to make it a reality. However, providing players with more options for their best loadout behind a paywall is inherently gating. Telling someone that this weapon could theoretically be better for their particular playstyle, but maybe not be, simply proves frustrating in practice. While remaining optional, their position of value is inherently tantalizing, and saying, we're just like all the other weapons, this price tag is purely coincidental. Honest rings hollow. Thankfully, both weapons could be accured for a measly $10 each. That's right, for a higher price than the game itself at the time of producing this video, you too can own a revolver and a beam sword. While the value proposition of cost for content can often prove subjective, I don't think I'm in the minority for stating that $10 per weapon is frankly comedic, a punchline in capitalism. Although, I'm being unfair, you don't just get the weapons for twice the price of Half-Life 2, you're also graciously greeted with an additional five recolors of said weapon. To further bang your buck. Here's the thing, the additional recolors of these $10 weapons don't inherently increase the value of the sale, as until one actually owns the weapon, they have no real baseline for the value of said skins. That doesn't mean there aren't ways to trial run these weapons, though, try before you buy, so to speak. If 
you, like me, only chose to purchase the skins long enough to make a video out of them before refunding so you could pay rent this month, you can be a dirty cheater and use these console commands in offline games to try them out for yourself. Of course, you, entirely understandably, will not earn achievements or experience while doing this. The other route of access to previewing the value of these DLC weapons is the shared content feature. If you have a well-to-do friend who sees $20 as chump change and purchased the DLC for themselves, tagging along with them will give you a chance to take the Saber or Rhino out for a spin. So long as any one player in your party of up to six owns a DLC weapon, everyone in that match will have access to it provided they decide to play the class it's attributed to, and then save up the in-game dosh to purchase and use said weapon during the match. Does that make up for their cost? In my opinion, no. You could offer these weapons for $5 and I'd still be annoyed, but I could understand the purchase for those who often host game nights with their friends, being the benefactor for all of their comrades to have more content to try. Double that price, however, and that money could be better spent on buying an entirely new game to play instead. Now, I can hear some of you starting to wonder, as I can read thoughts after all, why does this matter? Who cares about two expensive DLC weapons in a PvE game? What's the big deal? And you know what? You're right. On its own, this system is not a big deal. Annoying, yes, but it hardly merits a video to complain about in its own right, as far as I'm concerned. My worry lies in the entirety of Killing Floor 2's monetization and advertisement strategy, including this newfangled scheme. Let's start with my biggest criticism of the title altogether, using unfinished content as a marketing ploy. The cycle begins with an announcement of a new opt-in beta, usually themed around some kind of upcoming holiday or the time of year. The beta will drop well in advance of its theme, such as the beginning of September for a Halloween event, and introduce a new map, weapons, gameplay mechanics, and tease at upcoming paid cosmetics. And these betas are exactly that, beta through and through. Often glitchy or blatantly unfinished, these early previews of updates are reliant on crowdsourced playtesters from the community to smooth out their edges. For instance, during the first beta for weapon upgrading where you would spend dosh in level to power up weapons, a nasty bug was introduced causing the game to stand for several seconds or even minutes on end any time a new weapon was loaded into RAM. This effectively made the entire beta unplayable until it was patched out. All the while, however, gaming news sites and players are spreading the word about the exciting new free content Killing Floor 2 added, and many community servers swap over to running the beta branch of the client, and the upcoming cosmetics are advertised and teased with loot boxes and keys still vying for your attention. All the positives are being praised, while negatives easily overlooked or disregarded because, well, it's a beta! Even though the game is paid and is buttering you up to ask money of you, criticism comes across as cynicism due to the early access nature of the content. So a month passes with a half-broken beta being the biggest draw to return players to the Z dimension. Then, when the right time comes, the chains are broken and the beta is integrated into the main client, fully launching the content. And to its credit, the betas, generally speaking, serve their purpose. Some of the bigger bugs discovered are likely to have been squashed and now the masses can enjoy the content relatively glitch-free, while being advertised to the same cosmetics that have been teased their way for a month on end. And a second wave of PR from players and journalists alike pushes those who may have lost interest for some time back into playing another round. My point being, while I doubt Tripwire has any malicious intent in this regard, what is seen as a free public beta for anyone to try, see upcoming early content and help make the game better, plays out far differently in effect. We instead receive half-baked, unfinished content, are told to do Tripwire's job of bug testing for them, and are shown all the cool paid costumes that they want us to buy, all while gaming news reports on the exciting new updates that you can play right now! Then a month passes and we get another update, completing the content which was already available, pulling the trigger on paid cosmetics, and all the while gaming news reports on the exciting new updates that you can play right now! Tripwire gets twice the buzz for half the work. Again, that's not not to say they're malicious, I don't think they're doing that on purpose, but it's always bothered me how players are willing to accept a broken product and be excited for it purely on the merit of but it won't be broken in a month. Meanwhile, outside of the game's holiday-themed events, very little actually gets done. Long-standing bugs and balance issues remain unaddressed, the matchmaking system continues to be wholly non-functional, but what we have instead is near every form of monetization in the book. Loot boxes, microtransactions, cosmetics, taunts, DLC, purchasable power, and a deluxe edition. All we're missing is a battle pass before the game collapses in on itself into a black hole of monetizing monetization from which nothing returns. Which leads me to my final question, why? 
Why do you do this? Well, according to Tripwire, it's simply due to not making enough money for our investment. Much to their credit, before going ahead with the release of $10 weapons, Tripwire released a statement about this new route of monetization. In effect, they're saying that the game does not make enough money to match the costs of developing it further, adding new maps and weapons in the sort. So they either had to scale back their release of new content, or simply find new ways of making money. My response to this is, I understand game cost money to make, obviously. But maybe your priorities should lie in the right places. Will releasing massive bug fixes and rebalance patches get you sensationalist headlines from gaming news sites like Gary Busey will be in Killing Floor 2? No, but for one, it will be significantly cheaper, and two, you'll earn respect from repeat players who are clearly your market for selling cosmetics to. I don't think you need to elevator pitch Killing Floor 2 to players anymore. The name is already out there. You'd be hard-pressed to find a person who loves co-op shooters, wants to play more of them, but hasn't heard of this wild killing floor thing. Your priority doesn't have to be creating more press, it could instead be creating a better experience. Unless, of course, your recent ventures have been flops, in which case you're looking to squeeze every last dollar out of players at the cost of goodwill. I find it to be healthy to compare the current DLC model of loot boxes, cosmetic shops, and individual weapon purchases to that of Killing Floor 2's predecessor, Killing Floor. Back during its prime, things were much simpler in the world of micro-monetization. Post-launch DLC was generally the go-to moneymaker for a game after its initial sale, and Killing Floor 1 is chock full of it. This, of course, is obnoxious for players trying to get into the game for the first time, or anyone who doesn't want to drop $5 every couple of months to take a brief look at the Harold Lot character pack. However, if nothing else, at least it kept things simple. You buy the game, there's DLC for professionally released content, and mods for community content. All the custom weapons weapons and maps in the sort you could ever ask for. That's it, and honestly, that was enough. The Steam Workshop alone provides the framework required for the system, and Killing Floor 2 is maintaining a constant influx of crowdsourced content. But the developers, in the name of pitching in their own maps and weapons, are asking players to spend $10 a pop on DLC weaponry, almost alluding to the idea that if enough people don't buy this lightsaber, Killing Floor 2 will cease to exist. Up until this point, Killing Floor 2's comparatively complicated and penny-pinching multifaceted system of in-app purchases could be near completely ignored, as it was purely cosmetic. The only exceptions were a handful of weapons which could be granted and shared by players who owned other games that Killing Floor 2 had promotional tie-ins with, such as Chivalry's Zweihander. And I remember players making a stink about this back when the crossover was first introduced, as it locked gameplay behind external purchases. But nowadays, the entire game for which that tie-in was based upon itself only costs $5 more than buying two individual weapons for Killing Floor 2 alone. Wait, chivalry still costs $25 in 2019? Maybe I sound like an old person screaming at a cloud when I say this, but perhaps life cycles for post-launch development of games are, on average, too long nowadays? Keep in mind, this is coming from someone who built a career on the back of a game that lasted way past its prime, so I'm hardly one to talk. But Killing Floor 2 entered early access in 2015, and we're coming up on its fifth year of existence at this point. Games like this can last theoretically indefinitely through occasional content patches, mod support, and developer cleanup, keeping the engine running so the players can drive the car. Ironically, few titles drive this point home better than Killing Floor 1, which maintained popularity in some form or another for ten some odd years and still has dedicated players to this day. And obviously, maintaining a multiplayer game this long costs money and developers have to get paid for their work, but I personally think Tripwire's priorities are in the wrong place. If it costs too much to release free updates this often and on this big of a scale, maybe you need to rethink your approach, rather than guilt players into giving you more money to keep the game alive. Maybe hold off on the Gary Busey, maybe every single enemy type doesn't need a new model and skin for every holiday on the Gregorian calendar, maybe you don't need to add robots. Surely developers could be moved over to other projects and priorities could be reassessed for KF2? Let the modding community thrive, give them more tools to create custom maps or weapons, or at the very least fix long-standing bugs and issues, reduce load times if possible. If nothing else, my personal suggestion would be finish what you goddamn started! Game modes like Objective and PvP are basically tech demos, having been all but untouched since their conception. Features like weapon upgrading and prestige 
remain bland. Holy uninteresting number increases simply for the sake of it. I don't think Tripwire are necessarily greedy, more so misled. The smash success of Killing Floor 2 was a boon for their reputation and made them loads of money, and I'm worried they've conflated the title's revenue stream to the product's quality. After all, they said themselves the main reason they're releasing DLC for KF2 was for the sake of adding content to the game itself, not for the sake of the company. It's to fund future updates for the game nearly five years on. A game doesn't need constant content patches to maintain a community. Sure, we get a new map every update, we get a few new weapons, that's all excellent and I'm glad to have it. But if it comes at the cost of locking a single handgun behind a $10 paywall, I for one would gladly take reduced production over decreased quality. Let the community take the reins, prioritize improving the game rather than expanding it. Thanks for watching, and take it easy.